Chapter 13 Lighting Our Lamps From within or from behind, a light shines through us upon things and makes us aware that we are nothing, but the light is all. Ralph Waldo Emerson The concept that we create our own reality is going to be a very difficult one to accept emotionally. We talked about core beliefs needing to change before a true change can take place. We used cliché terms that tell us that we create our own reality. We more easily see when something occurs to another person, the reason why it happened. We have talked about agendas, which are themes that run through people's lives. Nevertheless, how do we accept this in the light of so many painful issues of suffering and despair? Ultimately, each one of us will reach that position where we will understand what this concept truly is about. Spirit will achieve this eventually. It is a work in motion. We spoke about how the consciousness associated with various levels of energy begins to create images and interactive experiences. We indicated this whole process is an illusion and the trick is to not be trapped in the illusion. However, as we go through this process, there are certain illusions that are very painful and difficult to face. This is where our mind keeps us more powerfully trapped in Maya. It is like a very tough glue that is difficult to release oneself from. Follow the process of what is taking place with you as you are actually reading this. You are being told that you create your reality. You are being told that all the painful experiences that you struggle with, you have created. This will have awakened thoughts and emotions. Identify the emotions first and then observe how your intellect begins to rationalize what is being presented. Perhaps it challenges your core beliefs about life. Core beliefs are those things that you hold to be true. They influence how you take decisions and act in your life. I once had a situation where a newly graduate secretary was doing a brief internship at our clinical program. She had been a mother and decided that now that her kids had all grown up, she should be back in the workforce. She was very pleasant and warm. She had not realized that our clinical program was an integrative medicine. About an hour into work, we thought it might be helpful to orient her to our program. Suddenly, she became very agitated, upset, and stormed out, saying that she could not stay in a place that was satanic. She had discovered that we were providing acupuncture therapy for our patients. We had challenged some core beliefs in her that influenced how she responded. She may have assumed that acupuncture was associated with Eastern mysticism, which offended her own core religious beliefs. At the time of writing this chapter, I had been going through a really intense, stressful time. In my heart, I knew that I had created this painful reality. My struggle was with my intellect, I had difficulty accepting that I would do this to myself. One of my core beliefs was that negative things were caused outside of myself. I was being punished. I felt guilty and remorseful for something that I assumed that I had done. I decided that I was stuck in this emotional state. I recognized that I was feeding into Maya. My emotions were fair helplessness, hopelessness, guilt, and anxiety. I realized that the further I analyzed, the more energy I was feeding to Maya. I was like the first man in the story about the fruit on the tree. I was ignoring every opportunity to put in place what I had learned. As soon as I became aware of my behavior, I began creating diversions. 
It forced me to work at surrendering the outcome and have faith. When the time was right, the fruit would fall. I had been practicing these techniques regularly. I could switch my emotional state easier because of my previous practice. This is a struggle that takes place. It is our challenge to work at having faith and surrender. What we see as negative or destructive emotions are really opportunities to practice this. The issue of faith is a very important one. We are not talking about religion, but the belief that lies within us. We can awaken the grace of the divine. Christ led as an example for all of us to follow. He showed us that we could feel forsaken, but we are not. His teachings have influenced mankind for countless centuries. The more we build on our faith, the easier it is to overcome despair. We need help to create that transition. Until then, our default position is to feel the pain and to hold on to Maya. It is not only what we are familiar with, but also what seems to make sense to us. Let me tell you a story. Some of you may have heard the exploits of Mullah Nasruddin. In folklore, for centuries, there has been talk of Mullah Nasruddin as the wise saint whose comments appear to be very foolish. His exploits have been recorded in many languages. Whenever his exploits are recounted, people rush into judgment and ignore the message behind the words. They miss the importance of the third reflection, what is hidden in plain sight that we are not seeing. The exploits of Mullah Nasruddin are simple stories. Those of us who have read Aesop's fables will recognize a similar style. In fact, there is the claim that some of Aesop's fables are Nasruddin's teachings. Each of the exploits could be a brief paragraph or about half a normal page in length. They are easy to read, but they do not make sense. I have never ever got it right away reading one of these exploits. I enjoy doing this because sometimes even months or in one situation 21 years later, in the midst of dealing with someone else, an aha realization would take place. Bursts of wisdom would come from the understanding of what Nasruddin was telling me. It is also believed that the poor Thanorta Cervantes mirrored his character, Don Quixote, to Mullah Nasruddin. Here is one of the stories. I will summarize it in my own words. A neighbor of Nasruddin was returning home one night when he saw the mullah on his hands and knees under a street lamp searching for something. The neighbor asked him what was he looking for. Nasruddin replied that he was looking for his house keys. The neighbor then got down on his knees and together with Nasruddin began looking for the house keys. When they could not find the keys, they began looking more frantically for them. Ultimately, the neighbor realized that it was nowhere in sight and asked Nasruddin if he was sure that he had lost his house keys where they were looking. Nasruddin replied that he did not lose his house keys there. So where did you lose it? asked the neighbor. Nasruddin pointed to the dark and said, I lost it there. Then why are you having us look for your house keys here when you have lost it somewhere else? asked the neighbor, somewhat irritated. Nasruddin replied, because here is where the light is. I remember thinking that it was a silly statement. I also recognized that one day the meaning would come to me in a spontaneous way. It was hidden in plain sight. It did occur when I was least expecting it. I was listening to a client who was recounting his troubles. He was trying to figure out a way to solve his problems. He kept focusing on what had worked for him before. Immediately, a flash and a level of understanding about Nasruddin's story came to me. When we are looking for a solution, 
We as human beings keep looking where our experience worked previously for us. We keep looking under our lamp. I noticed it even more when the financial crisis took place. There were people who were struggling with their losses. They kept working harder at trying to figure out how to regain control of their financial strength. They resorted to using all of their past experiences and successes for ways in which to solve their current dilemma. They kept trying to arrange deals and use processes that were under their lap. It was very difficult to get them to recognize that they should be looking in the darkness because they were unaccustomed to that. I recall that when I would suggest this, they would listen politely, then the famous yes but would emanate from them. For most of them, it had become obsessive behavior that they were not willing to challenge. Whenever we have difficulty solving an issue, and we keep trying to do so, we are looking under the lamp and not in the darkness. If we were under the lamp, we would find a solution. So let us return to the concept of us creating our personal reality. The point I want to make was that whenever we are in crisis, we go back and try to understand it under our own lamp of past experiences. It is difficult for us to accept that we should be looking in the darkness. The Buddhists say that you should always take the road less traveled. For me, what it means is that it is important to look in the places where you have no experience. There may be answers and unexpected doors that can open for us. If we look at many successful inventors, many discovered their answers not when they were concentrating on the problem, but sometimes when they were otherwise occupied. The answer would crystallize when they least expected it. So in saying that we create our own reality, we have strong emotional responses to this, particularly if it is a painful experience. In the example of my situation, I was very clear that the issue I had been defending was based in truth and understanding. However, the person who was adversarial in this issue, I am sure, had convinced himself that he was also right. When we try to deal with very stressful situations, we keep looking for the light to argue our positions. Since we are not getting anywhere, I had to remind myself that I was being emotionally attached to the issue. I was ego-attached to Maya. It was so easy to personalize the issue, not only to myself, but also to the other person. So the most difficult task is having faith, letting go, and looking into the darkness. So why are we creating this reality? It is important to recognize that what is taking place in Maya is reflecting back to us like a mirror, an issue that we need to address. It is never told to us in bold, clear pictures. It is not that easy. We need to understand what the metaphor or the message is about. Imagine that there are hundreds of lamps within us. Some are large and some small. Some are lit and others are not. Some are on the surface, others are deep within. For me, the metaphor is that enlightenment is lighting all the lamps within me. In order to do so, from time to time, a lamp that needs to be lit will seek attention. We live in Maya, and our external reality is where we pay attention to the most. What is happening in our life we have to see as an opportunity to understand that a particular lamp is calling to be lit. It is playing out like a movie around us. Nevertheless, hidden in that movie are the hints about what issues we need to deal with. The bigger and brighter the lamp that needs to be lit, 
the more intense the emotional experience will be. For me, it is my family. For others, it may be health, wealth, or status. Depending on our agendas, it will play out in the areas that we are most vulnerable. So we are experiencing our life, and because of duality, we sometimes experience that life is great, and we want to hold on to that feeling. At other times, we have negative experiences and think that life is awful and we want to get rid of it. During those distressing times, we do not think that this is an opportunity for change or that a lamp is calling out to be lit. We think of it as a negative experience. We look for reasons within Maya to understand them. We personalize them to ourselves or to others. We create arguments to validate our position. Our position is under the lamp and we keep almost obsessively stuck there. When painful experiences happen in life, ultimately we need to address them. Our usual way of doing so hardly ever works. Sometimes we can wait it out. Many people do this. They go on a vacation or they become withdrawn. They take on other activities and then the issue disappears. Nevertheless, the issue always returns at another time and with a different complexity. The theme, however, is the same. If we do not perceive our issue, the universe will present it in a different way. Like the blind man and the elephant, the reality changes. It keeps trying to get us to recognize that the lamp needs to be lit. The issue may become more complex as it takes us out of our comfort zone and into the darkness. I remember a friend of mine who would get calls from one of her girlfriends whenever she's in crisis. I remember visiting this friend and there was a message on the answering machine from that girlfriend. She recognized the number, and before listening to the message, she told me the following. This is from my friend, and here is what the story is going to be. She's in crisis, she's suicidal, and she's desperate for me to call. She will feel like she wants to harm herself, and the tone of her voice will be really one of despair. I will feel guilty and want to return the call, but I can bet you the story is still the same. My friend then continued to say, she's just going through the breakup of an affair. I will bet you that the man is married and abusive. She will ask why this is happening to her, and she becomes more desperate as she gets older. Sure enough, it was right on the script. My friend then said, I have to do something differently because I am simply enabling when I phone back and I try to show sympathy to this friend. It does not work. I will feel guilty, but it will be different. What happened was that my friend was being triggered by one of her lamps. This had nothing to do with the girlfriend who was breaking up. It was all Maya. It was a reflection to her and the whole process was a reflection to me as it was being created in my reality as well. This incident was a trigger for me. It was from this that I recognized my issue of getting frequent crisis calls. Earlier, I recounted how I dealt with that and my process of emptying my cup. It was all a reflection of my own situation. I was creating this whole drama. I could have easily seen it as my friend's issue. I recognized that it was my issue. It was all Maya. Now I ask myself, what lamp is calling to be lit? By looking in the darkness, I found that insights were arising within me. Most of the time, these insights were out of the blue. One such was that the reason why some people were draining 
was that I was attempting to help them beyond what they were willing to help themselves. I remember in a flash one of my teachers telling me, whenever you help people beyond that which they are prepared to help themselves, you automatically inherit their karma. Whether I believe this or not, or whether it is true or not, it suddenly had an impact on me. The friends I love, and I'm always open to hearing them ask for help, are constantly trying to improve themselves and become better people. As simple as it was, it was a powerful message to me. I began changing my behavior and recognizing that I had created the reality of that friend who refused to take certain calls even though she felt guilty. I needed to do that. So I began working on it. It never even occurred to me that a simple decision to address that issue would have such a powerful outcome. Recognize that the lamp is begging to be lit whenever conflict arises. The more powerful the lamp needing to be lit, the more intense the emotional attachment and the desire to personalize it to someone, something, or to ourselves, it will be. We will begin to realize that Maya is reflecting back to us a puzzle which when we solve, actually leaves space for us to be filled with more divine grace. You may force me to kneel before you, you may think that you have conquered me. You have only conquered my pride. Look above you. My soul looks down at you. The Cosmic Game. Chapter 14. You made it to here. May your life be full of joy and every moment be so dear. For in your heart there is a light that shines upon your very soul. May that light grow bold and strong and keep you ever safe and whole. May the warm winds blow through all life's hurts and soothe the doubts that linger there. And when dark clouds that block the sun stand strong and feel no fear, for God is right there at your side in the earth and in the sun. Reach out and touch God's living grace and know that all is one, one with the Creator's touch that makes roses red and flush, one with the songs that bluebirds sing, one with the early dawn's flush. May your life from this day on grow richer day by day, and from all the world we wish you love to always light your darkest day. Peace and blessings to you and all those that you hold dear.